All right, you should be able to hear me. Okay, I can hear you. There we go, there we go. <laughs> Latif, thank you so much for coming on today. And what exactly is this? This is Smile Talk with Jacob, where we bring on masters of their crafts to speak to how they help people develop and enhance their self-esteem and confidence. Through the years that I've had the opportunity to get to know you, I was impressed to start and then continuously impressed as time went on. As I learned more about who you were personally and then everything that you've been through professionally and then education-wise, I don't think that I truly understand every bit of what you have gone through. And that's part of what I wanted to in some which ways selfishly share with others because I think that your path and your journey, although it is not done up until this point, it is one of the most impressive that I've had the opportunity to see. So with that, I wanted to ask, who is Dr. Latif Safor? All right. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And uh, um, first off, I would say that I am a a Christian husband, father, brother, son, best friend, mentor, and innovative leader. I think that sums it up. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, all of those things break out to multiple branches that, quite frankly, never end, and the roots are so deep. Yes. Which one do you feel as though has been one of the main principles, one of the main actions, one of the main activities that have really driven you forward in life? I would have to say uh, my faith, uh, those uh, things that uh, followed uh, my faith are driven uh, by my faith in a very intentional way. Um, so my interactions uh, as, as a husband, as a, a father, as a brother, as a son, as a friend, as a mentor, all driven by what I believe what my purpose is. And so I move in that way. Uh, and so uh, and my decisions are made in that way uh, to serve uh, those different things that are a part of me. And so I do that uh, very unselfishly and, uh, and a lot of times without a whole lot of deep thought because I, I know that if I'm in a particular space uh, where um, uh, this exchange between giving and receiving needs to occur, I just step right in and fill the gap. And so um, uh, faith leads all those other things that I'm involved in. How is faith installed within yourself? Uh, it, it, it sits as a, as a constant reminder uh, that um, these are the things that, that you put on this earth to do. And I am the firm believer that uh, one should be careful about compartmentalizing their life in a way where they don't think all things are related. And so, um, so that I learned that very early in, in my life that not to compartmentalize my life in a way where uh, faith is only here when you need it versus faith being part of you, your everyday life, your everyday walk. So um, so that's how it was ingrained in, into me. It's, it's, it's an ever-evolving uh, part of who I am. You know, people talk about the better version of yourself. But for me, that happens every day, every day that, that I'm allowed to be here. Um, a better version of myself is occurring. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're so right. You continue to grow every single day, every single moment, and any obstacle or any opportunity that comes your way brings you what it is that you can do to overcome or take advantage of that to grow as a person. So you've had multiple of these opportunities between a family a career, leisure activities, volunteer activities. We have joked around before where you become so 
woven into the fabric of what it is that you are participating in, where sometimes it's, it's, it's hard because you're doing so much. Right. How have you learned to say no, or what are the guiding principles that lead you to ultimately saying no? It's a great question. I think uh, uh, no is difficult. That, 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 that is a challenge, particularly when no is in between an opportunity to assist something or someone. No becomes a difficult thing to say. Um, but I think uh, no, um, the gateway to no is, is, is probably knowing um, that based on what you might bring to a situation, um, perhaps this is not the time for you to bring it. And, and, and so that's when uh, you become very creative and figure out, well, if not me, who? And a lot of times people ask that in the context of if not me, who? As if it should circle back around to you. But if not me, who? And then I find strategic ways to figure out who is the better person uh, to deliver, uh, whether the service, advice. So I've learned a long time ago, uh, sometimes you may have good intent, you may have a great message, but you may not be the messenger for that particular circumstance or interaction with a particular person. So no for me more so is removing myself and putting the best system or circumstance or person into that slot that I may think might be better for the situation. So no for me is, is more so um, how can we better, how can we make a situation better? And sometimes me saying no can make a situation better. Someone said one of the greatest qualities that a leader can have is to know when not to lead. And that can mean a multiple of things. Is that leading the message? Is that leading an organization? Is that leading a group of people? It can mean what it needs to based on what organization has in terms of what they need with their leadership, but then also what organization it is that you are bringing to either a club or an organization or a company as such. So I think that your ability to recognize that is a huge reason for the success that you have seen up until this point and what you'll see moving forward. And moving forward is exactly what I see you doing. You are always on the move. But I don't want the vision of what's to come overpass or overlook what has happened in the past. And education has always been a huge part of you, whether that be professional development, personal development, or education through classes. I mean, we're talking to Dr. Latif Safor, PhD. What impact has education had on your life? Education uh, for me in terms of its, its impact has been um, really the, the uh, early in life is, is, the, is the great divide in terms of trying to figure out what to do um, with your life. As a, as a young Latif Sephora, uh, what am I going to do with my life? And so education becomes that constant uh, pathway to figure it out. Um, and, um, and then eventually, over the years, it, it also became a, a way of uh, receiving some sense of enjoyment about learning and uh, and then to be able to apply those things to everyday life. And so one, on one end, it, it was a, a, a pathway to a career. And then um, and maybe the second phase with that is the, the benefit of learning something new and being able to apply it to a number of opportunities. And so, um, and so that's, for me, learning doesn't get old. You know, it doesn't stop at at a at an achievement associated with your learning, such as degrees. Um, but it becomes something that's en enjoyable, almost like a hobby. Mm -hmm. um, and so, whether um, I'm writing a book or whether um, I'm researching something that um, I might have seen on TV for a short bit of seconds 
that I feel needed to be expanded upon. Uh, whether my daughter is challenging me because I'm like a human Google. <laughs> uh, so the, the the learning process is always enjoyable and fun for me. So um, um, beyond it being uh, connected to a career, it's also uh, a hobby. And you have allowed yourself the opportunity to continue through this hobby of learning in which you are sharing this hobby with other people. How so? I want to bring to light the wonderful event that you put on for the Nardonia Hills Rotary Club. You put together a STEM event over at the high school that brought together people from the Northeast Ohio area within the STEM, within the STEM ecosystem and allowed people to once again realize that learning is fun and these STEM topics are interesting and there for people to continue to expand upon what it is that they're doing in school now and the opportunities within the future. Can you talk more about that event? I, I certainly can. I, I also would like to give some some context to uh, a little bit of my journey in STEM yeah. and, and why I'm so passionate about it. Please. Um, so, um, eighth, seventh grade, no, yeah, seventh grade, uh, I can remember being in a science class, and uh, the teacher was very knowledgeable about plants uh, or what have you, um, but the delivery was monotone. Today's class, we're going to talk about photosynthesis, and photosynthesis is a process. And though I found the topic interesting, I thought the delivery caused some challenges for me in terms of staying with uh, what was being taught in terms of an interest standpoint. Uh, topic, very interesting. Delivery, um, causing some challenges. So, um, ninth grade. Um a freshman football teacher uh, taught biology. Uh, and he would say, today's class, we're going to talk about photosynthesis. But before we talk about photosynthesis, did you see the football game? You know, and at this point, you realize that delivery is making a difference be between a class that's interesting but maybe not enjoyable versus a class that's interesting and very enjoyable. Again, he was a freshman football coach. He had a... Um, a greenhouse above the classroom, and you'll never think that he would be into botany. Mm -hmm. And and so that opened my eyes to science, and that was my initial interest in STEM because of how it was delivered. And 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 so um, and so I began to grow within the field of STEM at a very young age uh, because I, I began to received the privilege of instruction delivery. Um, and that's when teachers began to make a difference on what you decide to do, not because of the instruction itself, but how they deliver the content. And so I share that because um, the STEM event um, at Nardonia High School, some couple decades later, <laughs> Uh, still has been a passion for mine, uh, being a STEM professional, because I would go on to get degrees in STEM, go on to work into STEM. Um, I always felt that we need to um, provide that spark for students um, to be introduced to STEM uh, in several ways. And, and, and so this event was set up in three areas at Nadonia uh, High School. Um, it was uh, designed to provide um, exposure to students to the STEM profession. Um, it was also designed for students to look at uh, a career pathway through college, what colleges here in the local area have STEM programs, and to what degree. And then the other piece was through robotics. Um, which is an area that, that drives most industry, regardless of what you're in, there's some level of robotics. And, and so we wanted the students to get that spark through those three areas. 
um, to have uh, STEM professionals, such as the number of zoos that came out to talk about uh, animal behaviors or what have you, from um, uh, the invention of uh, glassware or um, and, and even on the human human side of, of STEM we are diagnosing different diseases. Um, all of those we, we're sure created a spark in many of the students that attended there because they filled those tables wanting to get more information. Um, on the STEM academic programs, uh, one of the uh, local universities um, had has a program on video gaming. Oh, wow. And um, that was more of a pastime, um, which was a pastime. Now it's something that you can actually get a degree in. Mm -hmm. um, because regardless of when someone was introduced to video games, that is a constant reminder that behind the video games is a STEM professional who has uh, been educated in a way to design a video game in the way we see it and play it. But there are some technical aspects of that, and, and the students were exposed to that in a major way. Absolutely. <clears throat> and to hit on that topic with video games, there's this joke that I heard that um, <laughs> it had something to do with basically tricking rocks into being smart because when you boil it down i mean you're talking all of these semiconductors and these computers and these pcs you know there's not a person in there that's doing all this stuff they are literally raw materials that are being produced that are put into this motherboard that are conducting electricity that are translating zeros and ones yeah. to what people are playing on what was at one point just a big joystick yeah. to now something that has has, you know, a controller that has multiple buttons or now the keyboards as most of these gaming uh, stations are switching over from a console like a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox One or Series X and to now being physical dashboard or like, you know, computers with desktops and, you know, the screens now, yeah. you know, they're talking you know, 144 gigahertz and all of this stuff. And it wasn't until I wound up going ahead and purchasing a PC myself where I'm just like, oh, this isn't as easy as just stopping by Best Buy and grabbing a computer screen and a computer. It's like, no, you want to take a look at the graphics card. You want to take a look at the CPU. Yeah. What characteristics of the CPU do I need to pay attention to? How fast do I want my graphics card? If I want more frames per second, is that on the graphics card? Is that on the CPU? Well, honestly, none of it's going to matter if you don't get a monitor that can support that. Yeah. So the opportunity to learn that is something that I would say is less seen in the classes for what has been up until this point and is luckily becoming more of a component to the secondary education that we're seeing. Yes, yes, I, I, I agree. Um, many students want to see now, how is this connected to what I want to do? You know, I mean, it's not one of those things where you, you just say, you know, get your education and as you get closer to it, you will, you'll, you know, be exposed to why you had to do all this work. Mm -hmm. And and I think now students want to see that much earlier in their academic career. Um, and so that's the reason why we chose ninth and 10th graders, mm -hmm. uh, because we wanted them to think critically about what it is they want to do as it relates to STEM and get this broad spectrum of um, what fields that they can go to, go, go into, mm -hmm. uh, particularly uh, whether it's the um, medicine, whether it's robotics, whether it is uh, uh, botany, whether it's zoology. Um, um, and we feel we did a, uh, an excellent job in giving that, providing that broad spectrum of all the STEM fields that one can go into. We even had someone from NASA, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's it's limitless. We're we're very excited. Um, though that was the first, we consider that to be 
a a an event that we would like to do annually, mm-hmm. and so uh, we we intend to to continue to do that particular STEM event each year. You brought up a great point personally, based on the story that you told about connecting with STEM at seventh grade. At the district conference over at Rotary that I was just at, the CEO and president of the uh, Cleveland Science Center was just saying in her keynote speech that seventh and eighth grade are the most multiple or potentially impactful years to really capitalize on a student's interest in STEM. And if their interest is not captured during that time, it is far less likely that that will be a career path that they move forward with. So that's almost too coincidental and kind of crazy that you have that exact story because that's exactly what she was saying. Um, and I love that for you. And that has brought on some pretty cool opportunities for yourself sure. post-grad. What exactly has Botany done to excel you professionally? Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so, um, so graduating uh, from undergrad, West Virginia State University, uh, with my bachelor's in biology, I went on to Marshall University uh, to pursue a master's degree in biological science um, with a concentration in environmental microbiology. Um, What's interesting about that question is, um, as a side project uh, to my thesis, I was looking at the medicinal properties of plants. And so when you get at the at what botany is, it's the study of plants. But when you do a deep dive, um, you can really start looking at the medicinal values that plants have. Um, and and so uh, that uh, exposure to botany made me wanted to see what medicinal values uh, certain plants have on the growth of bacteria. Why is that important? Um, so for those who um, well, most people know that, that, that common colds or sore throat, um, though it's uh, caused by virus, some are caused by bacteria. And, and so when you think about onion, you think about raspberries, um, garlic, uh, those all have these medicinal values that will cause bacteria to grow away from it or, or reduce the growth of bacteria. So that's important, um, and though you might not want a person walking around with garlic breath, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but in a laboratory you could see that that bacteria cultures um, growth is reduced when exposed to different plants that you uh, extract there. Um, you, st- you, you take an extract from a plant by boiling the plant. Um, and then you know take it take some of that out of the out of the beaker and, and expose it to bacteria and you'll see that it's growing away from it. Um, and so botany for me, my interest in botany was more so through its medicinal properties uh, that plants have. Some plants you know, some plants you don't know, and and so um, and so my my primary interest going into graduate school was in bacteria. Mm-hmm. And uh, looking at um, studying bacteria, uh, whether it was on the medicinal plants' impact or effects on bacteria, or also uh, looking at E. coli. E. coli, uh, um, during that time, was found to uh, uh, infect meat, hamburger meat. Not sure how much of a deep dive you want here, <laughs> but uh, um, and so some um, uh, uh, food processing chains were affected by it, yeah. and and so the scientific piece, because that that's where I'm going with this. The the scientific piece here was 
trying to discover what was the source of contamination. And, um, and though they are very, uh, even then, they were, they're, they're very uh, technology advanced ways to um, identify different bacteria strains. Ultimately, you, you want to find out if this contamination is um, happening on a farm or is it simply happening because of the preparer not cleaning their hands mm-hmm. properly? And so, so those kind of things were very exciting to me. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of a lot of science, and also um, um, a lot of discovery to try to figure out um, where the source of contamination is coming from. So, where do you do this research? How how, do you, how does one get the opportunity to do this research and studying that you had the opportunity to do? So you can do that at most universities that have a. Uh, biological science program or microbiology program because you're, you're, you're dealing with um, uh, small organisms. Mm-hmm. And so, so you have to use equipment that can kind of magnify what you're looking for. And so whether you're looking uh, to identify what type of bacteria uh, you have versus trying to look at their DNA and so all of these things can be done in a uh, well-funded laboratory at, <laughs> at a university. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, you, and you're able to uh, differentiate biological uh, bacteria strands one from another mm-hmm. to determine um, where they're coming from. Because certain what we call fingerprinting and certain patterns in their DNA or RNA uh, lets you know that it is um, that these particular uh, bacteria strands primarily come from this source versus that source, and so bringing it back up, that's how you kind of know where the contamination. So you can go back to the food chain process and say your contamination is coming from X, and that kind of research it, it hooked me in and at a uh, while in graduate school working on my thesis, um, and then at that point, that's when I knew um, that that was the career that I wanted to pursue, the type of STEM that I wanted to do, and that was laboratory research. Everyone's talking about these essential oils. What are your thoughts on them? That takes me back to the medicinal property piece. Uh, I know there's two major types of oils. There's fixed oil. There's essential oil, uh, fixed oil. It's the kind that just kind of sits on your skin. Essential is the kind that penetrates your skin. Uh, something that has menthol in it. You can feel it kind of tingling. Uh, and so um, uh, essential oil um, may be used in a very generic sense. I know I took it places that I probably didn't need to take it. <laughs> but... but uh, um, um, I think uh, uh, for me, if it if it if it has true medicinal value, mm-hmm. um, I certainly you know um, uh, think it's you know o- okay. Uh, sometimes folks uh, use essential oils in a very generic way, yeah. and so. Um, but if we're talking about something in particular, um, that again was extracted from a plant that's um, that's connected to some research, then I, I, I certainly, you know, put all the confidence behind uh, whatever regulating body that cleared yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. So. Oh, goodness. <clears throat> the older I get and the more people that I talk to, I continue to be amazed with the knowledge that they have about what it is that they have spent their time understanding, practicing, and continuing to learn about. So uh, I, I will acknowledge that you just barely scratched the surface in regards to every bit of the research and all of the knowledge that you have. But I appreciate that because 
it gives us enough to be able to get a general understanding and in some which ways scratch the itch that we have to either learn just enough about it to feel a little bit more comfortable and knowledgeable about it or give us that little creak in the door to really open it up and say okay this is interesting to me what more is there yes. behind that closed door yes yes and you have multiple doors and that i think is what has continued to amaze me the more that i've gotten to know you is you know, Dr. Latif Safor is not only a person who is well versed within botany, you are not only a family man, but you are well through your journey that is not over of being a businessman. How did you either pave this path yourself or who helped you pave it? Yes. Uh, so, uh, transitioning from this very uh, structured uh, corporate America career path to the business was more of a realization uh, for me to um, try to see if there's someone, well, not someone, but, but is there something else out there that can give me a new challenge? Um, I was able to hit uh, my career very early in terms of uh, achievement, you know, receiving invitations to uh, present my work at conferences, publications, uh, different awards. Um, and so I wanted to uh, find out that there's a, a, another opportunity out there to, to, to challenge myself where I'm more so uh, accountable to others. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for, for for me, um, mentorship is always attached to everything that that I do as well, and and so I saw that this is not only a business opportunity to own, to become a franchisee of a local sub shop, um, but but also to uh, interface with employees that I would hire, and and see opportunities to mentor them to. Um, give them a platform to be um, the best that they could be. Um, it's not just a no such thing as uh, um, a a restaurant business. It's all business. Um, but why you have employees there? You want them to have an experience that they may not get elsewhere. Um, because my approach is different. Um, I also use uh, my location to interact with the community. I've supported so many different sporting events. Um, I've also uh, used the uh, community aspect to connect with other businesses. Um, and so that way you feel more so a part of the community and not just working in the community. And that's always important uh, to me. And so this business venture, though it is a business, was also about mentorship and having some sense of community. Community is one of the most important things that anyone can be a part of and one of the most attributable things to someone's success. Yes. I stand by that. Whether it starts at the home with your family, whether it is the relationship that you have with friends, whether it is a fraternal organization, those three things are those that I find most people gravitate towards to receive support and then what leads to them ultimately seeing things through that they ultimately would not have seen through had they not had that support. Very good. Everyone finds support differently, but who or what is it that you turn to for support? I think everyone should have uh, three or four, maybe five uh, friends that they could bounce ideas off of. Yeah. Um, uh, someone who has a, a, a perspective uh, without judgment, 
you know, so that because uh, a lot of times your thoughts um, are unfiltered. I mean, they're raw, and so you need to be able to express those in a way where uh, someone um, who's receiving those uh, can help. You know, you organize them or, or confirm what you might think you already know, and that's more. Well, maybe these are not something that I should focus on right now. Maybe this is something more down the road, or maybe I shouldn't even invest that much time in the A or B, but maybe C is the better way to go. And so I would say everyone should have those uh, people in, within their circle uh, where they can share unfiltered thoughts. And, uh, and I'm uh, certainly uh, blessed to have those people. You couldn't be closer to the truth right there <clears throat> because the opportunity to have a conversation with someone that you know, isn't being tracked, isn't going to bring you judgment, but allows you to get your thoughts out and then filter through the actions that need to be taken. That's huge. Right. That's huge. Because I always think about it in the way where you know, I just want to get everything out. But sometimes you need to get everything out to get to a point to be then work off of, to then move forward from. Right. And if there's too much bouncing around your head and you can't get one thought out before another winds up coming in, then you just wind up talking yourselves into circles and then you just never get anywhere. Absolutely. And you're – idea of mentorship is is huge i think in the way that i've always looked at things is you want to find someone who you can have these unfiltered talks with who may be someone that's right in your line you know like at your level okay because they know the frustrations they understand the frustrations and in some cases they may or may not be familiar with what it is that you're going through but then i always like finding someone that's just a little bit ahead of where i am how can I speak with them to pick their brain, to learn from their experiences, because they're not too far out to basically offer advice that we would say, okay, you've been doing this for way too long. Yes, you are, you are successful, but a lot of your success is based off of something that can no longer be done in that way. Um, but I do think it's important to, once again, reach out to those people who have been doing it for an extended period of time because there are going to be fads, there are going to be ideas, and there are going to be distractions. But more times than not, there is a recipe for success. Yeah. And that recipe for success, although, although may not be the exact same, there may be a little tweak, a little extra pinch of salt, or, you know, I feel like in today's age, a boatload more of sugar, you know. You need to be a little bit more sweet nowadays to to get things done and get things where you want them to be. But ultimately, the opportunity to reach out to someone or a group of people is going to lead you to a level of success that you wouldn't be able to otherwise do yourself. Uh, yes. I, 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 in listening to uh, what you just said, it, it also uh, it stimulated a few thoughts, and, and that is... Uh, seeking the wisdom, um, and I've always been one to like uh, who, who really enjoys sitting down, speaking to senior people who are more senior than me. To your point, um, because I I don't uh, subscribe uh, um, to the thought that um, their life's path is so outdated because you know there wasn't no internet then, mm -hmm. all these other things that we like to attach to make them relevant or irrelevant, yeah. you know. Um, but there's still this uh, dynamic called life. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and living within this life uh, dynamic, there's still commonalities that, that occur. Um, and, and you don't need technology to make a decision, you know. And there's a lot of things that you don't really need um, to do that sometimes we uh, are a bit uh, murky on thinking that the wisdom that we might be seeking might be outdated. And it's not outdated. Uh, it is applicable to, to where we stand today. And so seeking that wisdom, um, um, and, you know, it's interesting 
when you're speaking with someone who who is a senior person and and you're sharing some things and you see their facial expressions and you know they can almost complete your sentence because they know what you're getting ready to ask them or they know what you're getting ready to share. Uh, the great thing about that exchange between speaking to uh, a senior person is that you realize that on one, one end, you're not walking into uncharted water in terms of life experiences, that, that there is a, an answer for it, you know, uh, that that you're not just kind of left out there, still trying to uh, figure it out. That there there is um, there's these multiple choices that you can kind of pick from, and 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 again having someone in your circle where you can get that information because sometimes you you don't have the answers and you don't have to have all the answers. I mean that's that's the joy of having relationships, and so. Um, but having relationships within your circle, having uh, someone that you mentor, because you can learn from someone that you're mentoring as well. Uh, having someone within your peer group, someone at the same level, then having someone who is older, you know, who is a lot more traveled, um, is what composes of my circle. Uh, and because I feel that, that that dynamic in life or that exchange that you get from having these relationships helps you all grow within the circle. It's not just being a recipient of it because this is your circle, but it's the exchange of what you give and what you receive. And someone's willingness to receive is also, I'm sure, going to be a huge part of a successful mentorship or a successful training session or a successful learning experience because if you're not able to or willing to accept what it is that other people are saying the advice that they're giving or as hard as it may be the criticism that they are issuing that you have to receive if you're not able to take those things internalize them and understand that every bit of it is to help you improve then you're just going to be stuck in your ways and not able to ultimately move forward. Um, I, I, I agree. I also uh, have also learned that at the time that the message is being shared, it may not be for you. Mm. T- tell me more. You could, someone could be listening to this podcast and not connect to certain aspects. Next year, five years later, there's a connection. And so no message is a wasted message that sometimes in your life's maturity, you may not just be ready to your earlier point, you may not be ready to receive the message, not because it's a bad message, it's just you're not quite ready for it. And um, when you go to a graduation and hear a commencement speech, when you go to a church and hear a sermon, uh, or when you're somewhere hearing a guest speaker somewhere uh, or anything online, um, there's certain things, certain messages connect instantly. And others, if you go back to it, you then get it because you finally caught up to it in your life experiences. Now it's applicable, you know, to what's going on and in your life. And so so that's what I mean by that. You know, some, some messages um, are, are the now and later, you know, and, um, and, and some, some are for now and some are for later. And that's going to be attributable to parenting, yes. education, within the classroom, coaching, whether that be life-related or sports-related, yeah. you're so right. I think about it in the way where I'm just like, what in the world are my track coaches having me do this for? Yeah. Now, there's part of me that like obviously understood it, and then there was part of the frustration of me putting myself through this just for the sake of putting myself through it because I enjoy the sport. Yeah. But 
um, it wasn't something that I truly understood. Yeah. And, and not, not, not why we were running, but like more so the purpose of what it is that we were doing at that time to achieve what it is that we wanted to do. But that message is a whole lot harder to receive when they got us running eight or nine miles, <laughs> yeah, for you sure. know, in a hot summer day <laughs> yes, yes. versus being able to look back at it years later when things have changed because we're no longer doing those or we're no longer in school. Right. And you take a step back and you're like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. But I think that's a great point as to why you should always be learning or be open to learning. And not that things go one ear in one ear out the other, but it's a reason why you should remain cognizant of the fact that there are messages out there that just may not be right for you to receive and understand at that time, but eventually they will. Yes, yes, for sure, for sure. I mean, that 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 is, uh, I've been a huge, um, you know, advantage for where we are today in terms of being able to access old footage um, from, you know, individuals who were teaching on a particular topic or expressing their thoughts on on different things. And so um, that keeps the message fresh and ready when you're ready for it. So. Because... How are you continuing to learn at this time? So uh, many of the things that stimulates my learning is the curiosity of what things are or what they're not. And so uh, whether it's something that I see on the news, something I hear on, hear on the radio, uh, or some thoughts that I may have that, that drives me to want to learn more about something, um, initially starts with uh, some, some level of curiosity uh, that I have. Um, um, so I've never been the type who wants to be spoon-fed information. You know, I like to go, go out and figure it out on my own. That's the research side of me. That, um, and, and a lot of times in learning new information, you have to be uh, bold enough to accept it. Whatever you find out, you have to be bold enough and honest with yourself enough to accept what you found. And, 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 and if you have a platform to share it, you have to share it the way you found it. No manipulation, you know, you just have to accept it uh, for what it is. And that's, that's this absolute uh, fact that scientists deal with and, and, and receive, and that's the way I was trained. Um, and so for me, it all starts with the initial curiosity and, 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 and then in finding out the facts, uh, being willing to accept them as they are. And you become an expert on these fields that you are interested in yes. and share that knowledge with those who are willing and able to accept it. So do you do any like do you, uh, adjunct professor work or do you teach any classes? Have you done any of that? I've, I've done some of that. Uh, I've, I've taught uh, some biology courses yeah. uh, before. Um, was very excited about doing that um, um, because I felt myself becoming that ninth grade biology teacher, you know, because I wanted, I knew that I had to present it mm -hmm. in a certain kind of way, you know, and I taught a summer college course, and, um, and so I was, the, the excitement was not so much the content, but how I was going to creatively present the content. Mm -hmm. And so I was really excited about that. And it was a lecture and lab, and so I was able to um, infuse my uh, techniques on laboratory um, methods or what have you. And so, um, yeah, so I, I do enjoy uh, the teaching aspect of it. Um, because I realized that, that in order to shape uh, students' ideals about science or STEM, it has to be interesting. Because there's a lot of terms that are not used in the everyday world that are only really applicable within STEM content. And so you have to present that in a way where it's exciting. 
Exactly, because sometimes the unfamiliarity with those words can lead to a little bit of like confusion, which would lead to someone like not wanting to open up that right. box. But instead, no, it's it's let's be interested in this. Let's peek a little further. Let's turn that page. Let's understand how, what, and why is 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 this what it is? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, because in, in, in reading these reading these particular words, whether it's biodegradable photosynthesis. Uh, um, um, meiosis, mitosis, you know, those are not everyday words, mm-hmm. you know. And so, um, and, and so my approach is always pulling out all those words and, and going through the words first, defining them, and then using those in context and instruction. And so, um, um, and that's how you make a connection to the learner. It's knowing, knowing people always say when you're speaking, know your audience and you also need to know the learner you know how they're receiving the information and that's the joy in teaching uh is is of the art of teaching mm-hmm. is is knowing the learner and, and knowing how they're receiving the information so that you can have a breakthrough in how they comprehend what you're teaching them and sometimes as you said with the messages that you're sharing through your teachings that breakthrough is not recognized by the student that you're teaching until later on in life. More times than not, that is the way that it works. So one thing that I've been doing in terms of practicing gratitude is reaching out to old coaches and old teachers to really tell them how much they meant to me as I progressed through life and where their teachings and messages got me in life because I mean I I don't know I think that that's something special and I'm sure rewarding to the teachers as well because it's their mission to help youth continue to grow learn and develop and ultimately make a positive impact for their families and society as such so yeah that 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 has stopped me um, in public places running to into old teachers uh, that stopped me in my tracks to tell them just that thank you yes. and some so I've only did what I was supposed to do I, yeah yeah but but thank you me thanking you meaning thank you for for being the person you were and and your approach towards teaching you know here's what it done for me you know and um, uh, once upon a time, in working in the hospital, I would see quite a few teachers, you know, coming and going um, that I've had in the past, and uh, and and having that privilege to be able to thank them, uh, and, and knowing when that moment is there, that it's not just hello, good to see you, but 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 taking that moment because that moment may not come again, uh, and so uh, so you're right on point there. The value of being able to acknowledge those who have shaped you in a very Uh, deliberate way yeah yeah it's so nice to be able to see you light up when we're talking about teaching we're talking about education when we're talking about personal and professional development um it's exciting it's exciting and um it brings to light a lot of the reason why i'm doing this because I am talking to wonderful people that are doing wonderful things that have found a purpose within their life that they are able to share that makes a positive experience for others that you have the opportunity to share all of that with. So, I mean, aside from, you know, everything that we've talked about or to recap everything we talk about, Latif, I want to ask you, what makes Latif smile? Uh, very good. Um, so I would say uh, being able to observe this this art of strategy or strategic planning or, or this art of uh, fruit of a person's labor. Um, you see it when someone graduates, whether it be high school or college, and you see their family members, and there's a story there. To get that person to walk across the stage, there's a story, and everybody has their own story, 
and you know that there's some effort and some 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 you know everyone's effort is different but for some it's it's a lot it took a lot more effort to get to this this place of walking across the stage um and so that always makes me smile because I, though I don't know the story, I could see the story, you know, and um, and that's that's from an ex- external ob- observation lens, um, and then internally uh, for me, it's the same result uh, when I know that I put in a lot of effort, and something finally comes to fruition, you know, and and the strategy that goes into getting those things done. I'm really big on strategy and thinking things through. Um, and so that makes me smile consistently, uh, whether it's someone else's narrative and the effort they put in, into that to, to, to achieve certain goals or my own. Uh, I, I enjoy that process of strategy plus effort equals fruit of your labor. That's, that's more so my life is equation. Um, strategy, effort, fruit of your labor, and so that makes me smile uh, every day because uh, you know I'm, I'm I'm always privy to you know my uh, personal narrative there or someone else's, and and so that that puts a wide smile on my face. Yeah, yeah. and you're always smiling. Yeah. I love it. That's why it's so enjoyable to be around you. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us, your expertise with us, and in some which way, a lot of a lot of life life lessons with us. Uh, I wholeheartedly appreciate that. And if there is someone out there that wants to continue to follow along with all the good things that you're doing, where would you like to point them to? I would point them to my uh, LinkedIn page. Uh, I am accessible there. Uh, you can. Um, see a lot of, uh, uh, you can see my career path. You also can see uh, some of the things I've done in the community, um, uh, different links, different interviews that I've done in the past. Uh, and you also can see my uh, publications. Uh, if you want a, a bigger snapshot of me, certainly you can visit my LinkedIn page. Continue to do everything that you will do in the future by your guiding principles and you will continue to impact so many lives. Latif, honestly, just like thank you for for being you. Um, You don't know how much I appreciate it personally. Um, Like I said, you're just, you're, you're an awesome guy and you're so much fun to be around. And I am once again impressed by every bit of who you are and what you stand for. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the platform to share a little bit about me. Absolutely.